Welcome to the Hillsdale College Online Courses Podcast. I'm Kyle, the Director of Online Learning here at Hillsdale. And I'm Juan, and I'm the Director of Online Learning Marketing here at Hillsdale. And uh, we are back with a new course today. We've been going through the Book of Genesis and uh, with our course, The Genesis Story. And we're starting the Exodus Story, the second book of the Bible today, also with Justin Jackson. Yeah, we're really excited to be able to continue in this series with Dr. Jackson. The, the Genesis course that we released for online courses five years ago remains one of our most popular. And I think people really respond to the way that Dr. Jackson, he's an English professor here at the college, who's taught a course every summer called Reading Biblical Narratives. And I think people have really responded to his presentation from all sorts of faith backgrounds and the way that he kind of helps us slow down and notice the details of the Bible, especially the way that it's written, and do a careful reading in ways that maybe unlock and deepen our theological understanding of the Bible in remarkable ways. We, we had a lot of fun with Genesis, and we've had a lot of people ask us if we could continue and jump into the second book of the Bible. So we're very excited to be able to present that. Yeah, one of the things I appreciate about his approach is that, you know, I went to Bible school, in, which I, I do enjoy doing this, which is getting lost on certain words and parsing verbs and things like that. That's enjoyable, that's valuable, and but sometimes you can get lost in the weeds like that. But what Justin does is really gives you a big picture approach of the book while keeping in mind certain details like special words, which he calls the lead motifs, words that are repeated over and over and over in the book and tell you something important. Like in Exodus, he'll mention that the hand of God is something that's constantly repeated and, and you have to pay attention to those things. Uh, so it's 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 a great way to look at a book and really get the big picture of what God is doing, what he's doing with his people. It's it's um, I love this course because of that. Yeah, so this is the start of an eight-part series on the book of Exodus. If you're interested in taking the full course, uh, we do always recommend that you go to hillsdale.edu slash course. This Exodus story course is available there. You can watch the videos, which provide some additional depth. We, we add the artwork uh, connected to this course. We provide text and, and other motion graphics to, to help enhance the lecture. We also have quizzes and, and study guides and reading materials for students that are interested in diving deeper, maybe earning a completion certificate if they do all the work for the course. So that's available uh, along with our more than 40 free online courses at hillsdale.edu slash course. We're very excited to present to you today the first lecture of the Exodus story taught by Dr. Jackson right now. Hello and welcome to this course on the book of Exodus. I'm Justin Jackson, professor of English at Hillsdale College. Many of you have taken the other two online courses on the book of Genesis and the David story, and I'm really excited to present to you this reading of Exodus because Exodus, in many ways, is the central narrative of all of the Hebrew Bible. Much of Scripture is going to refer to Exodus throughout. If you recall in Genesis, there were nods towards the Exodus moment, even early on in the life of Abraham when he runs into his own Pharaoh and the Pharaoh sends him away. So Genesis is already looking forward to this. And even at the end of Genesis, if you recall, Joseph was Pharaoh's right-hand man. This is where we left. Uh, the Genesis narrative was right here in Egypt with the Israelites having been led there by the grace of God. And even more to the point, if you recall, when Joseph dies, he dies as if he were an Egyptian at that perfect Egyptian age. And that leads us specifically into Exodus chapter 1, as Joseph is in fact invoked here and that the Pharaoh did not know him. This is the moment in which God claims Israel for himself, and Israel claims Yahweh, Elohim, Hashem. They claim him more or less, <laughs> as, their, as their own. Uh, so it's a beautiful narrative, and it's a very important, the narrative uh, within Judaism as it recounts the Passover, the parting of the Red Sea, the movement from slavery into freedom. In the Christian tradition, it's, a, it's an extremely important book. In the Gospel of Matthew, he can't seem to get away from the Exodus narrative. In Christianity, the Greek word for 
Passover, which in Hebrew is Pesach. The, the Greek word is Pascha. In the English-speaking world, we call that Easter. So it's a recounting of this very narrative of, as well. And for Christians, of course, it's also a movement from slavery to freedom, but it's also kind of that existential meditation that we're ultimately slaves to death and that Christ at that Passover gives us the path to eternal life. So I give you those first two kind of religious meditations on the importance of the book, only to say we aren't going to be covering that so much in this course. Uh, we'll be dealing with uh, a, what would I say, a, a more basic theological understanding. And so the theological understanding I want us to move forward with in this book, because a lot of this reading, what I'm trying to do is show you the literary qualities of the text while not ignoring completely the theological implications. So the theology we're going to deal with is a pretty basic one. There is a God, and that God asks certain things of his believers to obey. And inevitably, those believers will not obey him, and there may be some sort of correction, but that correction is there in order to get them to turn back, to repent, to turn back to God. So what I'm wanting to do here with the Exodus narrative is to read it very much as a penitential narrative. How do we get the Israelites to turn back to God? God comes back to him. He says, I've heard your cries. I'm turning back to you. Now it's your turn to turn to me. So, of course, they'll turn to God, but we'll see multiple places where they also turn away from God. So that's the first aspect of the penitential narrative. And now, just to be a little more shocking to you, I think there's a penitential narrative going on here with the Egyptians and perhaps even Pharaoh in the text as well. And that's when we get to the plagues. It is, can God convince the Egyptians and even Pharaoh to stop and turn back to him? Can he gather a foreign nation to believe in him alongside the Israelites? It's a tricky question, I know, but I think when we sift through the text and read it in a literary fashion, we're going to see all sorts of nods towards this possibility. So I want to now just begin at chapter 1, verse 1 in the narrative, and I'm just going to read a little bit here and then go back to comment. And these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each man with his household they came. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all these persons springing from the loins of Jacob were 70 persons, but Joseph was in Egypt. And Joseph died, and all his brothers with him, and all that generation. That's just traditional uh, biblical literature expansion. We've talked about it before. And the sons of Israel were fruitful. I love this line. The sons of Israel were fruitful and swarmed and multiplied and grew very vast, and the land was filled with them. I think what we're supposed to see here are the echoes of Genesis. This is the very opening of Genesis, of the land swarming and teeming uh, with creatures. And I think two things are going on here. One, if you recall in Genesis and the patriarchal uh, episodes, one of the common themes you would see is the barren woman. So having children was actually a difficulty. And now that they're here in Egypt and in, in slavery, they're very, very fruitful. And they're very much uh, multiplying as the command was in Genesis. That's the first thing. The second thing I'd like to point out, though, is that the text is immediately using creaturely imagery with the Israelites here. And even there, I say the Israelites, and, and this will be important. Biblical texts will often call the Israelites Hebrews from an outside perspective. And what we're going to see here in these early couple of chapters is the difference between an inside and an outside perspective. You'll notice that, and we'll read here in a moment, that Pharaoh will call them the Hebrews. That's because he's an outsider. Whereas God from the inside will call them the Israelites, or he just calls them Israel. So pay attention to that. So from the outside, the Hebrews, you're going to see lots of animal imagery here in these opening chapters. There's an objectification of this, of this people. And a new king arose over Egypt who knew not Joseph. And he said to his people, mark that phrase, you're going to see kind of jumping between this. His people, your people, my people, this people. There's always a distancing or a bringing in with regards to, to Israel. But notice, and he said to his people, look, the people of the sons of Israel is more numerous and vaster than we. 
Come, let us be shrewd with them, lest they multiply. And then, should war occur, they will actually join our enemies and fight against us and go up from the land. And they set over them forced labor foremen, so as to abuse them, that is to say Israel, with their, that is to say Egypt's burdens. And they built store cities for Pharaoh. And they abused them. Notice the repetition of the line there. Abuse, abuse. So they did multiply, and so they did spread, and they came to loathe the Israelites. So the more you seem to abuse the Israelites, the more fruitful they happen to be. And I think this has something to do with the nature of suffering in the Hebrew Bible. If you recall in Genesis, uh, the angel says to Hagar, God has heard your suffering, now go suffer. And I take that as this great phrase of much of Israel's existence throughout the Hebrew Bible. And notice what they do with that suffering. They thrive. They multiply. They become stronger almost. And the Egyptians put the Israelites to work at crushing labor, and they made their lives bitter with hard work, with mortar and bricks and every work in the field, all their crushing work that they perform. Notice the repetition there. The repetition is work, work, work. This is all they're supposed to be doing. And the flip side is multiply, 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 multiply. Everything seems to be undercutting Pharaoh's plans here. And the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other was named Pua. And he said, when you deliver the Hebrew women and look on the birth stool, if it is a boy, you shall put him to death. And if it is a girl, she may live. And the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had spoken to them. And they let the children live. Notice the line there. They feared God. That's going to be one of the other themes that we pay attention to throughout the narrative, is the way in which the fear of God leads to obedience. And obedience gets you to stop and turn back and follow God there. Notice what the the midwives, they feared God. They let them live. One of the things I want you to pay attention to is that it's the women who are the first to trip up Pharaoh here. It's the women who do this. And it turns out it's going to be the women in these first couple of chapters who keep tripping up Pharaoh. The midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had spoken to them. Notice the opposition between God and Pharaoh. They feared God. They did not listen to Pharaoh. And they let the children live. And the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why did you do this thing and let the children live? This is a great joke, by the way, that you see here going on here. And the midwives said to Pharaoh, for not like the Egyptian women or the Hebrew women, for they are hardy. Hardy there, the Hebrew word there is hayot, which means they're almost like animals. They're creatures. So what are they doing? The Hebrew midwives, I think they are giving to Pharaoh precisely what it is that he wants to hear that these are just animal-like people. And it's like, we can't help it. They're just like animals. We try to get there and they birth far too quickly. And God made it go well with the midwives. Notice why. Because they don't kill the children. They feared God. So what does God do? He makes it go well with them. And the people multiplied and became very vast. Here it is, multiplied. Biblical text, when it keeps repeating these things, we have to pay attention to that. And in as much as the midwives feared God, he made households for them. Here's this frightening line. So he can't get the Hebrew midwives to do it. So what does Pharaoh do? And Pharaoh charged his whole people saying, every boy that is born to you, you shall fling into the Nile and every girl you shall let live. It's frightening. So at first, just go to the Hebrew midwives. And now he says and gives charge of all of the people. And a man from the house of Levi went and took a Levite daughter, and the woman conceived and bore a son, and she saw that he was goodly, and she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took a wicker ark for him and cocked it with resin and pitch and placed the child in it and placed it in the reeves by the banks of the Nile. Okay, I want to stop here. You're getting a a great prefiguration of a lot of the narrative that's about to come. A couple of things. This scene is going to be very reminiscent of the flood in Genesis. In the flood in Genesis, you have people on an ark who become a remnant at an utter destruction of the world, but the people of the ark, Noah and his family, become the remnant of those. Here, what do you see? Moses being placed in an ark in the water as well. This is prefiguring kind of the destruction that we're going to see that comes with the Passover. That's step one. Two, the image of placing the child in it, in the reeds. The reed there is this is Suf. 
in uh, Robert Alter, in, in other translations, what we know is the Red Sea, um, the Yam Suf, can also be translated as the Sea of Reeds, just cl close, very close right there to the Red Sea. So we're already seeing just this nod towards the reeds. Another issue is the, is the water imagery here. Water imagery is going to play uh, throughout this text quite a bit. The plague that comes to the Nile, when they're in the wilderness, the bitter water, Moses striking the rock for the water, the parting of the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds and the destruction of the Egyptians. Water is going to play out here all of the time. So you get this nice moment here of, of just this nod towards the narrative to come. And his sister stationed herself at a distance to see what would be done to him. And Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the Nile, her maidens walking along the Nile. I hope we can all appreciate what's going on here. Pharaoh told the Hebrew midwives, kill the children. Now the, the narrative shifts to Pharaoh's daughter. So first, the Israelite midwives disobey uh, Pharaoh. Now what are we going to see? Pharaoh's own daughter is going to disobey Pharaoh because it, it seems abhorrent to kill these children. And she saw the ark amidst the reeds and sent her slave girl and took it. And she opened it and saw the child. And look, it was a lad weeping. I just love this line. And she pitied him and said, this is one of the children of the Hebrews. Notice she recognizes who he is, which means what? This is an obvious, obvious sign of disobedience to her own father. Notice how she speaks of the Israelites as Hebrews. She sees them as outsiders, and yet she's going to save the child and disobey her father. And his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, that is Moses' sister, shall I go and summon a nursing woman from the Hebrews that she may suckle the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And the girl went and summoned the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, carry away this child and suckle him for me. And I myself will pay your wages. I love that detail. I myself will do it. Don't go to Pharaoh. Don't go to anybody else. Come to me and I will pay your wages for this deed. Well, why? Well, she's trying to keep this secret. She's trying to save this child. Hillsdale College is a small, Christian, classical liberal arts college that operates independently of government funding. And we want you or your son or daughter to apply. At Hillsdale, students grow in heart and mind by studying timeless truths in a supportive community dedicated to the highest things. Hillsdale College costs significantly less than other nationally ranked private liberal arts colleges and receives regular recognition as a best value. And nearly all students receive financial aid. Our robust core curriculum, vibrant student life, an eight to one student to faculty ratio make for an education like no other. For more information or to fill out an application, visit hillsdale.edu backslash info. That's hillsdale.edu backslash info. And the woman took the child and suckled him, and the child grew. And she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became a son to her. What a beautiful line. And he became a son to her. Pharaoh's daughter, her name is Bithia. And please keep this in mind for when we finally get to the moment of the Passover. And she called his name Moses, Moshe, for from the water I drew him. The word there is he who draws out or another play on is he who is drawn out. And I love the play between the two because this seems to me, Moses' name seems to indicate the struggle that we find uh, with him throughout the entire narrative when he's told to go and bring Israel out of Egypt. There always seems to be he's trying to draw out or he's being drawn out, either trying to draw the people out or God's trying to draw him out as well. So there's going to be this tension uh, throughout the narrative. And it happened at that time that Moses grew up and went out to his brothers and saw their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man of his brothers. There's that repetition of his brothers, of his brothers. And we know that whenever we see repetition in biblical literature, the lead word, the lead motif, we have to pay attention to it. It's how the narrative is establishing itself. 
And he turned this way and that and saw there was no man about. And he struck down the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. Now, there's some question what this means. He turned this way and turned that way. I think there are two readings here, two potential readings. On the one hand, I think an obvious reading is pretty straightforward and simple. He's checking to see if anyone's around to be able to catch him as he kills the Egyptian. And that makes sense. Is anyone watching me as I do this? That's one reading. A second reading, though, shows a Moses who's a little more hesitant. He's looking around this way and that way to see if anyone else is going to do anything about this. That second reading is, is pretty nifty because it's consistent throughout. When God confronts Moses to say, you're going to go rescue this people, Moses says, who am I? I can't do this. He shows a hesitation there. Much of what Moses does in his interactions with, with God and with the Israelites is a matter of hesitation. The first one's straightforward as well. Moses wants to do justice, though he may be a little immature uh, in his justice here thus far. And he went out the next day and looked, two Hebrew men were brawling. And he said to the one in the wrong, why should you strike your fellow? And he said, who set you as a man, prince and judge over us? Is it to kill me that you mean as you killed the Egyptian? Two things going on here. There's a certain irony there. Who set you as a man, prince and judge over us? It's a great question because no one has yet. But eventually Moses will be set is a man, prince, and a judge over Israel. At this point, he's not at that place. And notice, now they've also revealed, do you mean to kill us the way in which you killed the Egyptian? Is that how you do justice? And Moses was afraid, and he thought, surely the thing has become known. And Pharaoh heard of this thing, and he sought to kill Moses. And Moses fled from Pharaoh's presence and dwelled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by the well, and that should kind of raise some flags for us when he sits down by the well. In Genesis, we know that if there's a scene by a well, it often ends, or almost every time, ends in a betrothal scene. We have it with Jacob and Rachel. You have it with Isaac and Rebecca. And it's going to be the same thing here with Moses as he comes to meet Zipporah at the well. But the most important thing is that we learn something crucial about these biblical characters in these betrothal scenes, something that will etch out for us kind of the almost the totality of their narrative as it comes to us. And the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them off, and Moses rose and saved them and watered their flock. What a lie. Here's his betrothal scene at the well with shepherds. And what does he do? He had to flee because he killed the Egyptian. Now when he comes here, now what does it say? He rose and saved them. He just drives the shepherds off. This is what Moses is eventually going to do in the narrative. He's going to rise and he's going to save. And he's going to struggle with trying to save Israel because the burdens are going to be so strong, but he must, God must get him to rise up and save them. And they came to Reuel, their father, and he said, why have you hurried back today? And they said, an Egyptian man rescued us from the hands of the shepherds. And what's more, he even drew water for us and watered the flock. The one detail here to pay attention to is that they identify Moses as an Egyptian. They look at him and they see him as an Egyptian. And he said to his daughters, and where is he? Why did you leave the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses agreed to dwell with the man. And he gave Zipporah's daughter to Moses. And she bore a son. And she called his name Gershom. For he said, a sojourner have I been in a foreign land. And it happened when a long time had passed that the king of Egypt died. And the Israelites, notice the shift there, the Israelites. And why is the shift to the Israelites? They aren't the Hebrews. Because it's God who hears them. So the narrative shifts from the outsider perspective of the Egyptians. Now we're getting the God's eye view. And so what are they called? They're called the Israelites. They groaned from the bondage and cried out. And their plea from the bondage went up to God. And God heard their moaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. I just want to pay attention to that. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the God of the patriarchs. This is the God of history. 
This is the God that there is a closeness and a proximity to Israel. It says here, it's not just simply he remembers only Israel, but we're going to start to see the name of God is the God of of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because he's a God who works closely within history itself. And there's this beautiful line, and God saw the Israelites, not the Hebrews, God saw the Israelites. That's that closeness. That's that relationship. And the final line, and God knew. And that verb, God knew, it's a very intimate verb. Uh, If you recall in Genesis chapter 4, we're told that Adam knew his wife Eve and she bore him a son. That means to have relations with somebody. There's an intimacy there in that euphemism. Those marital relations is to know somebody. What do you see here? God saw the Israelites, he sees them, and God knew. It means there's something intimate that God knows about the people. He hears their groanings. He hears their suffering. If you recall, even in Cain and Abel, when Cain kills Abel, it says the blood cries out to God. In Genesis, Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, they cry out to me. This is a God who hears the injustice, but here he hears the injustice committed against his people, the Israelites. And so next time we will be covering chapters three and four as God comes to Moses. As God hears Israel crying out, it's time to bring Moses back to his people, to lead them out of Egypt, to bring Israel to God. And in some ways, this is a bold statement, but also to bring God to Israel. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Hillsdale Online Courses Podcast. If you want to continue learning about the Book of Exodus or other topics, please visit hillsdale.edu slash course. There you will find over 40 free online courses, including Ancient Christianity, the Genesis Story, Classic Children's Literature, and many more. The courses include additional readings, study guides, fully produced videos, and you can chat with your fellow students on a dedicated forum. Upon completing a course, you will also get a certificate. All our courses are free because we believe that a virtuous citizen is the best defense for liberty. So pursue the education necessary for freedom and happiness at hillsdale.edu slash course today. That's hillsdale.edu slash course. Thanks for listening.